And the peace and the grace and the love of Jesus be with each and every one of you. I've always commented that in the last five years, Our Lady truly has called me. I hope you heard the words to that song. The Lady is calling. And in the last five years, she's called me to many, many places. Every state in the United States, including Hawaii and Alaska. Fiji Islands. Maybe if some of you are good in geography, you know where that is. I didn't until I went there. I have no idea what's to be said to you. Because you determine what is going to be said tonight. It's the power of the Holy Spirit, you see. And it's how you respond to the message that really brings out what God wants to say to you tonight through this. Through this microphone. That's what I am. Just like this. I'm just an instrument and I, a microphone. I can go in front of people and do all these things and never become nervous. Except when I speak to young people. And I'm very nervous speaking to you. You know why? Because your souls are so precious. And the reason we're here, the reason we gather, the reason we come together to talk about these things is to give you eternal life, salvation. Those are words that you've heard for a long time. And maybe they become just words. But I hope with what I'm going to tell you tonight, you will understand how real this Jesus is. And how much this woman, who is the messenger of Medjugorje, the mother of Jesus, Mary, how much she loves you. There is no greater task given to me or to any of us touched by Medjugorje than to bring this message to young people. I want you to know that. I want you to know I'm nervous. I'm going to ask you to help me a little bit. Because I see we have young people here of all ages. How many of you here are 10 years old? Just stand up a moment. How many of you are 10? There's one. We had some others. Here's another. Well, just stand up. This won't hurt. I promise. You don't have to come up here. You don't have to say anything. How many 10s? Well, that's all right. We've got a couple. How many are 15? Stand up. Just stand up a moment. Okay. 16. All right. 17. Okay. I'm going to stop right there. And there's a reason for my doing this. The reason I've asked you to do that. You see this. The, the drawing back, you see the six young people there in front of Mary. They ranged from age 10 to age 17, almost 18. Now, the message of Medjugorje wasn't given to a priest, wasn't given to the mayor of the town of Medjugorje, wasn't given to some high business official. It was given to young people from the ages of 10 to 17. Every now and then we forget who created us, who gives us life, who gives us love, who pours out mercy on us, who brings us into this eternal light of happiness and individual peace. It's Jesus Christ. So every now and then, Mary comes to remind us of that love. You see, that's her job, it is not to take the place of Jesus. It is not to be a goddess. It is not to be a feminist. It is not to create anything just for Mary, but for her son, Jesus Christ. That's the whole message of Medjugorje. I want you to know that from the outset. That's what it's about. And it's to come to you in your openness now, in this age of learning. You're already of the age of reason, this age of learning, to make sure that the foundation is there so that as you proceed into life, you make the good choices for God. That's what life's about. Doing the good things and being happy and being peaceful. Not the kind of peace you negotiate. 
but the individual peace that can only come from knowing the true love of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you about these young visionaries of Medjugorje and tell you just basically, I would hope that most of you know a little bit about Medjugorje. It's a little village in Yugoslavia, or what once was Yugoslavia. It's no longer Yugoslavia. Now it's divided, and now there's great strife over there as there are faction fightings between the different ethnic groups. And very fortunately, Medjugorje has still remained untouched because it is a center of peace. And I think there's a very special covering over Medjugorje to make sure it remains as a center for peace. But you go back almost 11 years ago, June of 1981, a quiet little village so tiny that it's not even on the map, a village of only about 350 to 370 families, a village of people who had their little feuds, had their little differences, really no different from wherever you're from. The same things. Few of the people got drunk. Few of the people got into feuds. There was thievery. There were the same things that take place in our areas. But there was something there that was special. There was a special love of God and a real effort at devotion to God. And it was a basically predominantly Catholic community. And you have to understand that the government at that time is a communist government, and the religion of communism is atheism, which means a non-belief in God. And if you are a Christian or a Muslim, you would be harassed and persecuted. You couldn't have a job as a teacher. You couldn't work in the post office. You couldn't even run your own business because you were a believer in God. It just gives you a little background. Now imagine these young people. There's these two young girls, Ivanka and Biryana. One is 15 and one is 16. And one evening they decide to just go out to get away from their families to spend some quiet time together for a little girl talk. Ivanka has this cassette tape player and she has a collection of American rock and roll tapes. And Miriana, her friend, pilfers a few cigarettes from her father without his knowing it. And their purpose is to go out and listen to this music and puff on cigarettes for a while. I know none of you have ever done that, right? None of you. And I tell you this only so that you will understand that these visionaries to be were not pious little teenagers. They were ordinary young people who do good things and do sometimes wrong things just like you and I do. Well, they went out of this pathway and they were supposed to meet up with a third girl, Vitska. She had taken a test that day and was taking a nap and she was to meet them later. And they waited and listened to their music and smoked their cigarettes and Vitska never came. So they started back home and they're walking by this hill and they kind of got lost in their own thoughts and Mirjana was ahead of Ivanka. She was back here just thinking about things and I would imagine that on her mind was the one thing that just about a month and a half prior to this she had lost her mother. She had died suddenly of a disease that had just come on her all at once and they didn't know that she was that ill and just one of those things that happened. And she was very lonely and she missed her mother and she was sort of lost in her own thoughts and suddenly out of the right side of the corner of her eye, she saw this flash of light. And it was a, a brilliance of light like she had never seen anywhere else. As she very much startled, turned around and looked, and there in the light was the figure of a woman. And immediately, because of her Catholic background, she knew this was Gospa, which is the Croatian word for Our Lady. Notre Dame. Madonna, Our Lady. And she hollered out all of a sudden, Mirjana, look, it's, it's Gospa, it's Gospa. And Mirjana is walking straight ahead and she doesn't even bother to turn her head and she sort of smiles and kicks at the dirt a little bit. And she says, come on, Ivanka, don't play tricks on me. Our Lady wouldn't appear to us. We're nobody. 
Why would she appear to us? We're no one. And Ivanka is getting all excited because she wants to go after her friend, but she thinks if she does, the image will go away. And it's this beautiful image of this young woman, 18 to 20 years of age, and she has an infant in her arms. And she's covering and uncovering the infant, and then she's beckoning for them to come up the hill with their other hand. And she doesn't want to lose this. But suddenly she runs after Mirjana, and by this time several other young people have gathered with Mirjana, who's a good way down the road now. And she begins to plead with them that she really did see this, and she wants them to come back so they also can see what she has seen. And so they finally do. They, they come back. They concede maybe this isn't a trick. And as they go back, then they also are able to see the image of this woman. And suddenly they begin to understand this is something very extraordinary. In a little while, Vitska joins them, or she starts on her way and she sees them there staring and pointing at the hill, and some of them are on their knees praying, and a couple are crying. They don't know what else to do. They're too frightened. The image continues to beckon for them to come up the hill, but they don't go. They're too filled with fear. And then they see Vitska, they say, Vitska, come quick, it's Gospa. And Vitka in her mind thinks, this is terrible, this is blasphemy. Why are they making tricks about Gospa appearing? They probably are seeing snakes. And she gets very excited and runs away. And she runs into two young men. Both of them are named Ivan, which is a Croatian name for John. And they happen to be in a neighbor's yard helping themselves to some apples from their neighbor's tree once again without asking permission. And again, so that you understand the nature of these young people. And she asked them to come with her. They're playing this trick and maybe they see snakes and they want them to come, so they do. And this oldest Ivan is 22 and the other is 17. So they all go back and when they do, then they also are able to see the image of the woman. But no one bothered to go when she beckoned for them to go up the hill. They just sort of stayed there in a stupor, staring. And then it began to mist or rain, and it started to become dark. And so one by one, you could imagine, they just sort of started backing away, looking as long as they could look to see if the image was there. And then when they were finally out of sight, running as hard as they could to their homes. And of course, they tell their parents about this. And the parents are very upset. Don't tell anyone about this. People will think you're lying, and maybe you are lying. And the family teaches them a little bit. But they don't want the police to come and to begin harassing them and to create a disturbance. So they don't want to call attention to themselves. Well, that evening, word spread throughout the village. And the next day, at the same time, these young people felt this urge to go back to that same spot. An inner urge they could not explain. And when they did, Mary appeared to them again. And this time she didn't have the infant in her arms. And this time when she beckoned for them to come up the hill, they went flying up the side of that hill at a rate of speed that would make any track coach very proud. A couple of them were barefoot. Vitska and this little boy, Yakov, who was only 10 years old. Yakov is the name for James, or Jim, if you will. He was barefoot. Vitska was barefoot. And there's brambles and sharp pointed rocks. And they went right up over these until they were there at the site where she was. Well, there were about 80 villagers who had gathered. And they couldn't go this way. They had to go around and use this pathway that was used by the shepherds of this area for their goats and their sheep. And when they arrived, here were these young people, six of them, kneeling there. And their eyes were fixed to this one spot. And, of course, they could see nothing. The villagers saw the flash of light, but they did not see the image of the woman. And it was only afterwards that these young people who seemed to be in a, in a trance-like state began to tell them what had happened. Our Lady had called them and just looked at them and smiled for a while. And then suddenly, as you know, your curiosity... It doesn't stay bottled up too long. Suddenly, one of the young people said to her, Who are you? And she says, I am the mother of Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
And then they ask the next question, and I think it's the most important question ever asked about Medjugorje, and really the reason we're gathered here tonight. That curiosity, that teenage curiosity, why have you come? And she smiled at them and she says, I have come to tell you that God exists and that he loves you. See, that's the whole purpose of Medjugorje. That is why Jesus would send his mother to that remote village in the middle of nowhere. That is why we would gather here tonight. That is why my whole life has changed, because I realize that. God exists. Jesus is flesh and blood. And he loves us so much that he dies on a cross for us. So much that he sends us his mother. So much that our world is covered with angels that guide and lead us and take care of us. So much that in this way of living that we have today, where many of us ignore God, where many of us are just lukewarm in our faith, where many of us say, well, that's all right. When I get older, maybe I'll do that. Yet in his mercy, in his love, he brings us this realization that he's real. Well, they went on questioning, and then the questions begin to just pour out of them. And finally, they looked at each other because they knew who they were. They knew how good they were and how not good they were. And they weren't bad kids. They were good kids. But the little things. And so finally, one of them said, Blessed Mother, why did you choose us? And she looked at them, and she said, My dear little ones, I do not always choose the best children. You think about that. You see, I can relate to that. I can relate to that very much, and I'm going to tell you why. But first, I'm going to tell you that over the next few weeks, she came every day, and she began to teach them to pray. And she began to teach them to fast one day a week and to take their prayer and their fast and to put them together to offer them to God as a gift. And if this is what they, they want, conversion in their family, they want these certain things in their lives, this is the way you go about getting them. You acknowledge God by this prayer and this fast exactly as Jesus did in his days of ministry on this earth. And then she said, and I also have come to teach you penance. And that's the word everyone kind of frowns and says, what does that mean? Penance is bad. It means I've got to do something I don't want to do. Right. That's part of it. Penance is picking up the little crosses in your life each day. Penance for many of you young people is going to school and maybe not having the in-fashion clothes. That's kind of trivial, but that's a penance in a way. Penance is maybe going to school and not being popular and not being on a football, baseball, basketball, or some sport team and feeling the hurt because maybe you're not very popular, not with an in-group. That's penance. Penance is taking the little tiny things in life, the medium-sized things in life, and the big things in life, and saying, yes, God, if this is what you give me, this is what I accept, and I live with this, and then doing the best you can with what you've got. She taught them prayer, fasting, penance. She told them that she'd come to bring this message of love to the world, this renewal of the gospel message of Jesus Christ into the world. See, that's important. There's nothing new revealed in Mary's coming to Medjugorje. It's just a reiteration of what we've already been given in Holy Scripture and what your church teaches you. Not to change, not to bring new revelation, but to bring an awareness of the revelation we've already been given by Jesus. I do not always choose the best children. Well, let me tell you about this child. I'm a Protestant. I've been divorced. Fourteen years of marriage. Four children, many of them your age, when I was divorced. I lost my job because of the divorce. And because I lost that job and because I lost my family, I got very angry 
and that anger was directed at God, who else am I going to blame? Not me. And out of that anger, I made a vow. I said, I'll never go to church again. I'll show him. And I'll fix these people who fired me. I'll start my own newspaper. That's what I did. I worked as a newspaper man. I'll start my own paper. I'll do what we do in this country. We'll go out and build our own business. And I did. And for seven long years, I didn't go to church. I remarried. And I built my business not just into one paper, but into four newspapers. And then I added my own printing press, which is a very large expense and a large business. In other words, my young friends, I became an example of the American dream. I became a millionaire. I had it all. I had everything. And I did it all by myself. So I thought. Not the best people. Something happened. I had this little boy. He was two years old. He'd never been to church. And for some reason, my wife, Terry's mother, began on her one day, you know you really ought to have your child baptized. It just doesn't look right not to. In other words, it wasn't socially acceptable. So there was nothing spiritual. There was this social aspect. So she began to harp on me. Maybe we should have Kennedy baptized. And I says, no way. I don't believe in that stuff. I'm not going back to that organized religion. See, I believed in God. But I was going to do it my own way. I wasn't going to do it his way. I was going to do it my way. Just like I'd done my own business my way. And I'd become successful. So I could keep God out here at arm's length and do it my own way. You just stay there. When I need you, I'll call you. Is that not the attitude many of you have? Sure, let's be honest. This is how we look at God. There's no crisis in my life. Just stay over there. If I need you, I'll holler. But oh, do we holler when we do need him, don't we? Well, that's the way I was. Kind of arrogant, kind of cocky. I mean, after all, I'd gone out. I'd been fired. I had nothing. I lost even my company car. I had zip. And I went out and I, with my own hard work, built my own business up. And now, suddenly, I'm in that elite class. I got money. I've got success. I've got prestige. Isn't it amazing what we think we do? Well, my young friends, you're going to find out when you grow up, when you get married, and maybe it's already started, these women, you see, when they want something, they just continue. They never quit. Well, my wife was like that. It was like a slow dripping water on my forehead until finally I said, all right, Terry, go find a church, any church. I don't care what kind it is. We'll go for two or three Sundays, have that child baptized, and get it off my back altogether. That was my attitude. I do not always choose the best people. So we found or I should say my wife found this Lutheran church. And for the 14 years of my marriage, I'd gone to the Baptist church. But I was Lutheran by birth, but my wife didn't know that. She found this Lutheran church because it was the closest one. And we took our child there to have him baptized. And six months later, I was teaching Sunday school and serving on the church council. <laughs> That's what God does. He lets us play these little silly games with ourselves, with our own pride. He lets us think we're in charge when all the time he is in charge because of his love, my friends, his love. He just never quits on us. He's there constantly. I was glad to be back in that church. And had I not gone back to that church, I would have never learned of Medjugorje. Because several years later, in 85, as a matter of fact, in October, we were talking about modern-day miracles in our Sunday school class. And at the very end of class, someone mentioned these six young children in Medjugorje who claimed to be seeing the Virgin Mary every day. And I said, wow, what a great story for my newspapers. Nothing here in the heart, all of it up here. You see how much of the world you can just become immersed in? You forget God has this great love for you. You forget that He's the one who gives you everything. I, I, I. It's always I. 
We are the me society of today. We really truly are. Well, when I heard it, I thought that would make a great story. So I asked the young woman after class, tell me more. And she said, well, I have this Catholic friend who told me about it. I said, what's Catholic got to do with it? Well, you know, Mary always appears to these Catholics. You know, Mary is Catholic, right? No, no. My beautiful non-Catholic friends, I want you to know, she comes to every one of us. How many times I've had people ask me in the last five years, why doesn't Mary ever come to Protestants? And I just go, here I am. Because she did come to me. Had it not been for this Medjugorje, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I got a videotape and a book. I read the little book. I was impressed with this 10-year-old visionary. I mean, you can, you can fake this for such a, a period of time, but you can't do it for four years. You can maybe look at this as mass hysteria or something like that, but not for four years. You can investigate theologically, scientifically, medically, but you can't prove it's not happening. And these kids were very normal. They had been through all these tests, and they were very normal. I was impressed with this 10-year-old that he would stick to his story. And then I made a mistake. I sat down, and I watched the videotape. And I'm a journalist, you understand, and we're supposed to do everything in an objective sense. We don't want to be too touched by something, so we stay at a distance. We're taught to be skeptics. We're taught to be non-believers in any of these kind of things. So I wanted to stay at a distance and just do a story on this phenomena. Well, I made the mistake of watching that videotape with my wife. And the minute that tape began to roll, I knew this was no longer just a story. And there, halfway through that videotape, after seeing this witness, and I couldn't believe the number of young people who were going to this village from all over the world. Because by this time, four years later, the message had gone out all over the world, and the villagers had changed their lives, and people from all countries were coming there. More than 20 million people have gone to Medjugorje, and lives were being changed. Not just Catholics, Muslims, Hindus, Protestants, and Jews. And the amazing thing was that some of these Jews they didn't come back converted to Christianity. They became more devout Jews. And maybe the same with some of the Muslims. But the thing was that people were turning to God. They knew this was real. I saw that in that film. And then they showed these young people in this little room off to the side of the St. James Church in Medjugorje where they now were having the apparitions and they were in this room it was a small room there were a lot of journalists in there and a few other people and you could see how uncomfortable they were they didn't like any of this publicity and they had their hands folded and their rosaries were in their hands and they were there and then they suddenly began to pray and our father hail Mary and the glory be and they kept doing this over and over for about four or five sequences and then suddenly as they were praying in Croatian the our father and they were saying they all stopped at the same time and simultaneously they all fell to their knees and their eyes all focused on this one spot and then the camera began to just pan along their faces and you could see in the eyes of these young people this wasn't a hoax this wasn't something that was ordinary there was something happening to them and by this time, I'm on the edge of my seat, and I was muttering, this is incredible. I was no longer the journalist. And then my miracle happened. As I sat there watching, and you have to understand as a journalist and as a Protestant, I didn't know Mary. I never read anything on the Virgin Mary. I knew nothing about Mary except what I'd read in the Gospel of Luke. That was it, a little. And Mary plays just a small role in my Lutheran faith. So I knew nothing about her. And I, I'm watching this, and in my heart, I know it's real. That's all I can say. I knew it. And then I heard suddenly in my heart a message coming from the Virgin Mary to me, as incredible as it may sound. There's no other way for me to put it to you. 
It wasn't an audible voice. It was like the whole message was in my heart at one time. You are my son, and I'm asking you to do my son's will. And I thought I was going to pass out. And I quickly glanced at my wife, and she was watching intently, and she saw nothing of what was taking place with me, and I knew that she had heard nothing. And suddenly it was as though my life flashed in front of me, and it was the guilt of my life. It was all the errors of my life, and I felt totally naked in front of God because in that very instant I knew that Jesus Christ was real. He was flesh and blood real. And I wanted to go hide. And yet this gentle woman continued to speak to me. I am asking you to write about Medjugorje. And if you choose to make the spreading of its message your life's mission. Wow. If you read on in that beautiful sequence where the angel Gabriel came to Mary, you'll know that she said, let it be done unto me, as you say, without question. I wished I could say to you that's what I said, but I didn't. I says, I can't do this. I'm a Protestant. I don't know Mary. I don't know how to pray. I don't even know Jesus Christ, really. I don't know anything. Why would you ask me? How many times I would ask that over the next few years. Why me, Lord? Why? No answer, just this sense of love and peace that overcame me, and I knew it was real. And I sat there sort of in a stupor until it was over, and when it was, I remember my wife sort of flippantly turning to me and said, well, that's interesting. I can believe in that. And she saw this stricken look on my face. She says, what in the world's the matter with you? And I said, she spoke to me. Who spoke to you? The Virgin Mary. Come on. What's the matter with you? Aren't you overreacting? Isn't that what you would expect someone to say? That's what I would have said if it had happened to Terry instead of me. Get away. Come on. That's not real. That's your emotion. My friends, it was not emotion. That message is as real at this very instant right now as it was that day in October 1985. And finally she looked at me and she said, well, why don't you just take two aspirins and go to bed? You'll be okay in the morning. <laughs> anything to break it, but she noticed that that didn't do anything. And I says, no, I've got to see this video again. So she went on to bed, and I watched that videotape again. And when it came to that point where I'd heard that message, I felt it renewed within me. And when that tape was over, I sat there for a long time, and I kept saying, Jesus, why me? Surely you don't want me. And then I realized either I was crazy or that the mother of Jesus had just spoken to me. And I went on my knees for the first time probably in my life, and I truly prayed from my heart. I didn't want him out there anymore. Get over here quick. I need you. What am I supposed to do with this? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. Well, it took me six weeks to write my one story about Medjugorje, which turned out to be a four-part series. It couldn't fit into one story. It took six weeks. That morning I had gone into my office and I had tried, and I could hear her saying to me, go pray and study. You're not ready. It took six weeks, and finally I was able to pour it out. And the amazing thing happens. I live in an area in South Carolina that's 98% Protestant. And here I'm writing about this very Catholic thing. That's the way many of us perceive it. And I'm thinking, this is going to ruin my journalistic integrity. And I didn't want to run the story. Thank God I did. Thank God I did. And that story touched hearts all over the Myrtle Beach area and then into South Carolina and then in the surrounding states, and then into Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and into New York, and suddenly I'm getting requests from everywhere for copies of these articles. And I knew this would be my life's mission. I sold my businesses, and I began to learn to pray. I began to learn to fast. 
I begin to learn to accept my daily crosses. And this is one. And it's a lovely one. Here I am, almost six years later, speaking to you. I've been all over New York this week. I've spoken to thousands this week. We had so many people in the church the other night, you couldn't move. They were on the aisles. They were up on the altar. They were in the balcony. They were outside. They were in the vestibule. They were out the door. And many of them went home very unhappy because they couldn't even get near. I've been to all these countries that I mentioned a while ago. I've written two books on Medjugorje. I have lived the message that she gave me. And for me, that's the proof. That's the confirmation that she takes ordinary people, people who are not the very best, and she makes use of us. That's her role. We become instruments. The articles that I wrote finally were published in a tabloid and now today, more than 30 million copies have gone all over the world. And I didn't make any money off of those. And I'm not a millionaire anymore. And I don't do this for money. I don't need to do this for money. I already had it. I do this out of the love of Jesus Christ. Because that's the heart of the message, my young friends. The love of Jesus Christ. You should meet these young people. I know them today now. It would take too long to go into all the details. But I know them. I stay at the home of one of the visionaries. I've made 17 trips over there. And I'm still the journalist. I'm always looking for the cracks. And you know what happened when I came back from my first trip in Medjugorje, which was in May of 86, eight months after receiving this message? When I came back, I said... I want to be Catholic. And it was amazing because in that eight months I never thought about that. I never mentioned it. It was on the last day in Medjugorje that it struck me. I want to be Catholic. And I began to play, pray, Blessed Virgin, help me, direct me, guide me. And she said to me, No, not yet. You're to remain where you are. You're to evangelize from where you are. Well, of course, today I can see that. I couldn't see it then. Who's going to listen to a Catholic convert talking about the Virgin Mary? Who's going to listen to a journalist who happens to be also Protestant, who's been divorced, who's been through all this tribulation, and suddenly I'm out telling the world about Medjugorje? And I want you to know for the longest time I would not tell anyone the Virgin Mary spoke to me because I don't want them to laugh at me. They can laugh all they want now. I want to talk to you a little bit about the young people I've met at Medjugorje and the others who have been touched by that message. I was so deeply touched when I went to Medjugorje the first time in May. I went back in June. And when I was there that second time, I met a young girl there. Her name was Tanya. I wrote about her in my first book. Tanya was 16 years old. Tanya was a druggie. She'd been in the hospital seven times for OD. The eighth time she was due to go to the hospital, she had read of Medjugorje and she had begged her mother, who was divorced or not quite divorced, but separated from her husband, she had begged her mother to allow her to come to Medjugorje instead of going to the hospital. And she came to Medjugorje the first two weeks she spent tied down to a bed because she had the DT so bad. Sixteen years old. Well, I met her outside the rectory there as I was sitting out there waiting to speak to one of the priests one day, doing some interviews. And of course, she asked me who I was and immediately recognized me as American because we sort of stick out like sore thumbs over there. And within half an hour, she told me her life story. She got addicted at the age of 13. And after the drugs came alcohol. And after the alcohol came cigarettes. And after all of these habits and the need to support them came prostitution at the age of 14 to supply her habit. And here she was, 16, and had already lived, it seems, 60 years of life. 
And here she was under the care of one of these great priests at Medjugorje. She spoke Croatian. She was half Croatian, half Australian. She spoke the language fluently. She got to meet the visionaries. She went into the apparition room with them. She was present when the Blessed Virgin Mary came. She had this great counseling from these priests there. And yet she couldn't quite throw off this bad that had struck her life. We got to be very close. It was like a father-daughter relationship. It happened in just a matter of two days. And we had arguments and we had good times. And she could be real good at some times and real bad at other times. It was that demon pulling, pulling, pulling. And yet she had all this exposure to this goodness at Medjugorje. I'll never forget the last week that I was there. I was there for three weeks, my second trip. She was outstanding. She came to Mass with me every day. I met Father Slavko, who was the priest that was taking care of her there, so he would make sure that I wasn't some crazy loony that she'd picked up along the way. I introduced her to many of the Americans there, and she had time with us, and she got to meet other young people and see how things were, do were going. And here she was able to assist me and help me because she spoke the language so well. And I'll never forget the day that I left. She says, I really feel I'm healed. And I says, Tanya, I'm coming back in November. Where are you going to be? She says, I'm going to be here. I'm going to stay. I couldn't wait to go back in November. I was going back to begin writing that book and looking forward to seeing Tanya. And when I got there, she wasn't there. She'd gone off to Italy, and she was back on drugs. After all of that, and the reason I tell you about her is so that you don't think this is a magic word. That if you believe in Medjugorje, if you believe in Our Lady coming, if you believe that, that she's there to bring you this love and peace of Jesus Christ, that everything suddenly is going to be okay in your life. It isn't. You're going to have hardship. You're going to struggle with drugs yourself. You're going to struggle with the issues of today. As sad as it might seem, and I pray to God this is not true, but there's a possibility that some of you young people sitting here right now are going to OD on drugs. There's a possibility that some of you young women are going to go through the horrible holocaust of abortion. There's a possibility that many of you are going to grow up and marry and end up divorced and have these poor children scarred as mine were scarred. That's the reality. The reality is that you must exercise free will. You must choose God. You must choose His love. You must choose His mercy. And when you do, and those little crosses come along, they're very easy to handle. I went back to Australia in November this year. And I went to Sydney where... Tanya was living. I never quit praying for her. Even many of the priests at Medjugorje gave up on her. Even one of the visionaries said, I don't know, there's probably no hope for her. I never quit praying for her. She wasn't a family member. She was somebody I met, but she was someone that God gave me to pray for. I never quit. She'd call me sometimes at 4 o'clock in the morning at home. I need help. Pray for me. I'm weak. I may be taking a grin. Help me. Help me. Help me. Well, on this last trip in November, I went there and I met with her and her mother and her father have reconciled and they're wonderful people. Tanya is married now. And she has a three-year-old little girl. And she's going to church. And she still struggles. But she's trying. And she's got the support of her family. And in my heart, I know that if I hadn't continued to pray for her, it would never have happened. She probably would have been dead today. I never quit praying. And the beauty of this is that I find another young man there. And this was one of the young men that was helping me with the tours. And his sister, a young girl there, told me his story. Because he also was on drugs, worse than Tanya, living to the point where it was almost killing him, so thin and so dehydrated. He didn't eat, he didn't drink, he just took drugs. And he had a mother and he had a, an aunt and he had this sister who loved him. 
And they wanted to get him to Medjugorje. They thought if they could get him over there, they could just expose him to that area, that they continued to pray, to pray, to pray, they could save him. And finally it was decided that his sister would take him to Medjugorje. She was only 22. He was 26. He had been popular in school. He was on all the sports teams. He was the president of the class. He was the most brilliant kid in school. But somehow he got caught on all of this stuff. And all that was going to waste. Good looking young man. Now just an emaciated shell. Well the sister took him over there. They didn't have much money. They ended up in the wrong place. They had to travel halfway across Europe to get to Yugoslavia. When they got there, they had very little funds left. They were hungry. It was in November. It was cold. It was rainy. He was suffering from the DTs. They got there to the church. They were assured that somebody would help them find a place, and there was a nun there, and they asked her about it. She says, I can't help you. Come back in the morning. Some welcome to Medjugorje, right? That night, they slept outside in the cold. The next day, they found a priest, and he found him a place to stay. And they said, if you need to earn a little extra so that you can eat here, we'll let you help clean the church at night. So they did. By the second or third night they were there, the young sister took her brother to the Croatian mass. They don't understand a word that's coming over the, the system. And yet, something happened to him during that mass. The cold, the hunger, the weariness, the, the DTs, it all just seemed to evaporate. He felt the presence, the love, and the mercy of Jesus while he was there. He knew that this was real. And suddenly, the DTs were gone. They stayed there six weeks. Six weeks. It took that long. He went back home to Australia. His family was ebullient. They couldn't believe that this young man was healed. And he went back to work. And he began to gain weight, and he began to do well in the community. And here he was, now, as I met him, a seminarian, going to become a priest. To pay God back for saving his life, he's going to become a priest. You see the love? You see how it works with one, maybe it doesn't work with the other, maybe it doesn't work right away. And then maybe it works a little bit later. That's the way this love works. You know, mothers and fathers, don't beat on your young people because they're not listening. Just love them. Young people, don't alienate yourself from your parents because you think they're harping, because you think they're trying to run your lives. Love them. Bear with them. Try to work it out. Try to imagine each other so you know how you feel. When you let that love work in your life, then you have miracles that happen to you. Wonderful, loving miracles. Last week I was in Atlanta, Georgia. And one afternoon at 1.30, they had four Catholic schools, first to eighth grade, come together in this one school, St. Jude's, for me to speak to this young audience. And it was a great day. They were very open. They were very receptive and they loved it. And afterwards we had this question session. And during the question session, I asked those young people, how many of you pray this rosary? And about three hands went up. Dare I ask this tonight? How many of you pray this rosary? I'm going to do it anyway. How many? Honestly. I wonder if I ask you how many of you pray it daily, how many hands would go down? way to go. Well, I asked that that day, and about four or five hands went up. That was all. And I said, well, look, somebody gave me about 35 rosaries last night, so when this is over, and if you want a rosary, this woman over here will have them. You just come over, and she'll be glad to give them to you. It's first come, first serve. And I didn't think anybody would bother to pick them up, maybe three or four kids at the most. Well, when that was over, those kids, you'd have thought she was giving away gold or free pizza. They went rushing at her. And she was mobbed, and the chatter was loud, and the teachers were just sort of standing there aghast. They couldn't believe what these kids were doing. Well, in the corner, in this little vestibule over to the side, there was this beautiful statue of Our Lady holding 
the infant Jesus in her arms. It was a wooden statue, a very heavy statue. And it was on a marble table, a low squat marble table. And there was a very light cloth background behind it. And these kids were all over here about maybe 25 feet away from the statue. And they were laughing and giggling and I got one, I got one, get one for Sue, get one for Bill, this sort of thing. And suddenly at the last rose with the lady said, I don't know who to give this to. And finally she just reached out and someone took it. One of the kids took it. The minute that happened, the statue in the corner crashed to the floor. And the table toppled over. And there were some vases of flowers underneath it and they all shattered. And of course, what do the teachers do? Which one of you kids did that? First thing the teachers, who did that? What, what, is, what is the matter with you? And there were two ladies sitting over there, very far, and they came over there and said, nobody was near that statue. No one was near it. It just did that on its own. Bang. And a couple of these young girls were there asking me some questions. They said, oh, the Blessed Mother must be very angry at us because we're being so noisy and so pushy and so greedy. And I said, no, that's not the Blessed Mother. She doesn't do things like that. You have to understand that wherever Mary is, Satan is going to be there also. You have to understand how real Satan is. You have to understand that unfortunately today, many times in teaching, we don't even teach about Satan. He isn't real. One of those kids sat there and said, I don't believe in him because I think if I believe in him, he may be real. I says, he is real. You better know he's real. He has spoken about his scriptures. He is very real. I could tell you stories all night long how real he is. Sitting there that evening, speaking to about 1,500 people in the church that evening, I was sitting there praying, waiting to be introduced and very gently holding my rosary, and suddenly it just popped in half. And that night I got up and I spoke about Satan in front of that group. It was the first time I've ever done that. I told them what happened that afternoon. And I tell you so that you understand how real he is. He doesn't want you to have the peace and the love and the mercy and the compassion of Jesus Christ. He wants you to believe he doesn't exist. Because he's the deceitful liar. And he will take away your peace. And he will bring you that little white powder that takes away your life and gives you a life of drugs. And he will convince you that it's woman's choice, equal rights, or politics that creates this horrible scene of abortion in our world today. He takes away the goodness of God, or he tries. And you don't have to allow him. You pray. You pray in confidence. You pray in joy. You pray knowing that the mother of Jesus Christ is on this earth every day at 6.40 p.m. every evening. Still to these young people, every day it happens still. You pray knowing that people like myself have been touched and that we've been sent out to bring this message to young people, to middle-aged people, and to older people all through the world. You know what's wonderful? The kids in Australia are just like you. The kids in the Philippines are just like you. The kids in Trinidad are just like you. And you know what's even more wonderful? The Protestant kids are just as touched as the Catholic kids. This past December, a month after I came back from Australia, after five years, I became Catholic. The not yet was finally over. Thank you. I stayed as a Lutheran because that's what Our Lady wanted. That's what Jesus wanted of me. And I meet many people today non-Catholics who are touched by this message who feel the same way. And that's fine. You have got to learn to listen to God. You have got to be obedient to the call of God. How easy it would have been for me to become Catholic a long time ago. And how many people are saying to me, why did you become Catholic? Why didn't you stay where you were? You were more effective. And I say, because I did it out of obedience. Because Our Lady said, now is the time. It was wonderful. And it is wonderful. We are to become one family. We are to become one faith. It may not happen tomorrow or next month or next year, but it's going to happen in the very near future. I can tell you that. It's going to be because the family, the obedience, 
this goodness that God pours out on us is going to continue. I ask you, in this rally this weekend, you make a commitment, okay? You make a commitment to take another step forward in your faith and your love of Jesus Christ. Do you remember what I said in the beginning about when Ivanka first saw Mary on the side of that little hill holding an infant? Well, of course the infant was the baby Jesus. And I want you to see that as Mary at Medjugorje representing Jesus to the world. Here he is, your Savior, your Creator, your God. Because if you were standing where Mary first appeared, and I've had that honor, and you look down in that valley, you see a town that looks very much like Bethlehem. See, God always chooses the quiet, hidden, little things to touch us. You see, God always chooses young people because you're open, because you're in a stage of learning, because you have this tremendous potential of love. And you see, God chooses those who are most unlikely to be carriers of this message. Because you have to look at my life and say, why did you walk away from your money? Why did you walk away from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina? What a wonderful place. You know what I was going to do with my life? I was going to play golf, play tennis, and lay on the beach and enjoy it. That was my ambition. I'm working harder now than I've ever worked in my life. I've had a hard day today. I've been up a long time. I'll be up late tonight, and I go home worn out tomorrow. And that little Kennedy, that young two-year-old son, who was the catalyst who brought us back, this child who led us back into the church, will be 12. And I'm going to have to supervise about 15 boys camping out in my backyard tomorrow night. <laughs> no rest for the weary. And I love it. I love it. I am so happy. I am so at peace. I may complain a little bit. They lost my bag today. I've had to go through that all day long. I may get tired. I may get hungry. But I would rather do this. I would rather come to you. I would rather just spend this hour with you to make you understand how real God is, how loving, how close Jesus is, how real Mary is, how real the angels are, how real the saints are. So you'll start using them in your lives now. Use them. If you didn't have a guardian angel walking next to you, you wouldn't get home tonight. You couldn't go on the freeways. That's how much he loves you. He's got them here. This is not old, traditional, fundamental Catholicism. This is the reality of what Holy Scripture teaches us. I come to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ, not a gospel of Medjugorje. My last trip was in August of this past year. Every year in Myrtle Beach, I try to take about 10 kids from the Catholic school to Medjugorje. And this last year, we were unsure because of the war. We didn't know what to do, whether we should go or not to go. And maybe some of you have read of Medjugorje, have heard of some of the phenomena, the signs that happened there. Well, it happened one night, I was on my way to a, to a meeting with these young kids and their parents, and the purpose of the meeting was to either say yes or no, should we go or should we not go? Because we were due to leave later that week. We had the tickets, but because of the war, I was uncertain. I didn't want the responsibility of taking those young people over there. Well, as I got into my car in the driveway, suddenly I, for some reason, glanced at the sun, and you couldn't believe it. There was like a huge disc was over it, and these colors were coming off of it, and it was dancing in the sky, and this is the phenomena that happens at Medjugorje. This is the phenomena that has happened at Fatima way back in 1917. And I just smiled, and I said, okay. That was my sign. And I went and I told them we're going. And they stood up and cheered. And we did. And the first words we heard in the gospel reading when we got to Medjugorje was, be not afraid. We had a wonderful week. I want to tell you, I had 12 young women, no boys. And that's a penance. 12 young women. And we had this one nun from our school, and she was a nun from the old school, you know, very stern. Some of you are a little older, you may know about those things. And we brought her along to kind of help supervise. Well, she was a bit too much. She was on them day and night. 
and they were coming to me and saying, Mr. Weibel, get us some relief. Get Sister M.A. off our backs, please. And she was coming to me and saying, you need to talk to those kids. They're not going to the mass. They're in the shops. They're going to the pizza huts. They're not paying attention to what you brought them over here for. And I said, Sister, just sit back and relax. You see, I'd learned that when you get to Medjugorje, you let God do the work. See, we don't do it. I don't convert. Father doesn't convert. This weekend isn't going to convert any of you. You've got to do the conversion. We can just give the example. You've got to do the response. You've got to use that free will. So I said, just relax. They'll be okay. Well, I did. I gathered them together. I said, look, Sister M.A. is on my back now. So how about you do me a favor? Let's gather here on the steps of the church each evening because they pray the, the rosary and then the apparition happens. I said, let's sit here. We'll pray together and they'll have the apparition. And then if you want to go and go to the pizza place or go shopping, you can go do that. If you've been to Mass in the morning, you don't have to stay for that evenings. So they agreed. So we sit out there on those steps and we begin praying and they're, you know, looking around and enjoying themselves and a couple of them chewing gum and these sort of things. And suddenly after we got started, one of them suddenly screamed out, oh, Mr. Weibel, look, look. And she holds up her rosary chain and you can see about four or five of the links of her rosary beginning to take on a little tint of golden color. And I says, oh yeah, that's what happens when you pray over here. The rosary chains many times turn gold, and they do. This is one I have right here. I've had many of them do this same thing. And then another one screamed out, mine's changing too. And of course, they're all gathering around and looking. And then one of them says, oh, look at the sun. And they saw the miracle of the sun. And within a matter of seconds, my friends, let me tell you, they hit that pavement on their knees. Their heads were down on their knees, and they were praying like this. They prayed as fervently as they'd ever prayed in their lives. It was wonderful. We got to become a spectacle. People would come to see me with those kids praying every night on the steps of that church. And they were Protestant and Catholic kids. On the second to the last night, we had this one girl. She was 17. She was very quiet. You know the type, right? Doesn't say a whole lot. Very kind of inhibited. And... She was sitting over there and we were praying and the apparition took place and after the apparition was over, she gently reached over and tapped me. She says, Mr. Weibel, I think I just saw Our Lady leave from the bell tower and this is where the apparition is taking place. I said, what did you see, Laura? She said, I saw this blue image, which is exactly what many people have described. They see this blue image suddenly leave in this flash of light. She says, I, it was a blue image. And I said, Laura, that's wonderful. Tell the others. No, I don't want to tell them. I said, yes, you have to. Tell them. I don't want to tell them. I've got to share it. So she did. I brought those kids home. A month and a half later, they came to my house. We had a cookout, hamburgers, hot dogs, that sort of thing. Their mothers and their fathers were there with them. The mothers and the fathers and the kids wanted to form a prayer group to meet monthly. The mothers and fathers wanted to be part of it. The kids that had the influence on their parents because of what they had seen, because what they had felt, and they realized that the little golden rosary chains and the phenomena of the sun were the little tiny miracles of Medjugorje, the little bitty confirmations, sort of just a little tinkle to get you interested in it. They had learned to pray. And how wonderful it is for me now to go to Mass and you see some of these kids now who have gone on to high school and they always come up and give me a big hug and say, boy, we sure thank you for letting us go with you to Medjugorje. I get it constantly. That's my reward. This is my reward to just come spend time with you tonight. And I said I was going to speak for about 40 minutes and get out of here because I've got to catch a plane and I can't stop tonight. I can't shut up. And that's because I have such a love for you. That's what our whole apparition thing is about. She creates family among us. We don't know each other before tonight, but now we do. We know that we're all brothers and sisters in Jesus and that we have this wonderful, holy, spiritual mother to lead us. I'm going to give you two gifts in closing. And the first gift is from Our Lady. When we go to Medjugorje, just like with these young people that I took over there, she gives us a special blessing. 
It's the grace of God. Father read that scripture. Father, I've heard that reading. The one I like best is the one that says, Hail Mary, you are full of grace. The Lord is with you. That was the old version. Now we got the new one, O highly favored daughter. I like that one, full of grace. The grace that came from God himself. The words of Gabriel that came from God himself. You are filled with grace. Her special blessing is part of that grace. She asks us to give it to everyone we come into contact with, either silently or out loud. You don't even have to know the person. You read about some young person somewhere in trouble, give them Mary's special blessing because I'm going to give it to you right now. I give it to every one of you. It's not magic. It's not superstition. It is a blessing you can pass on in your family. It is a special blessing that you can accept to help you grow in faith. If you want to literally feel it, just raise your hands and accept it. Make a commitment and receive it. Just receive it. It's all right. And we say, Blessed Mary, we accept your gift. Isn't that a nice gift? That's from her. And I promise you that I will pray for every one of you every day for the rest of my life, and I mean that. That's not idle words. Every morning I lift you to Jesus. Here they are, Jesus. Every soul that I have spoken to, everyone who has written to me, everyone who has asked prayer requests of me, I give them to you. May your will be done in their lives. Will you pray for me? Will you pray for this mission? Will you pray that Medjugorje continues to turn hearts to God? Would you pray that the churches open their hearts and become one family? Would you pray for this country? Would you pray for your community? Would you pray, 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 pray every day? Just take a few moments each day and it'll build on you. Pray maybe a decade a day if you're not used to praying the rosary, then pray a little more. Let us pray for one another. God bless you and thank you for allowing me to come tonight. Thank you, Father. <laughs>